Well, thank you very much. Um, let's see. So today I'm going to talk about how we make some macroscopic objects from microscopic particles um, and how that turns out to be uh, surprisingly easy and cost effective for uh, microfabrication. So I'm going to start with an introduction, introduction to self-assembly, uh, why we study it, and what features make uh, a good building block for self-assembly. And I'm going to talk about the interaction that we designed for colloidal particles to interact and self-assemble based on their surface charge. And then I'll show you a bunch of different crystals and crystal structures and shapes and show you some of the properties that we get by assembling particles like this. <clears throat> so just to get us all on the same page on what kind of uh, structures we're going to be dealing with, I've got a red blood cell here for uh, scale. And so we understand this as you know, a very small object with a sort of delicate microstructure. And so if you envision then a material that has um, even finer and more precise structure, then the synthetic challenges uh, should be immediately obvious. And materials like this are very desirable because they have uh, exotic interactions with visible light. So the same way that an X-ray will scatter through a molecular crystal, visible light will demonstrate that same constructive and destructive interference through a microstructured crystal. And so here's an example of, of a microstructured crystal that has all different orientations, and you can see a brilliant display of color uh, as, as light is scattered in all angles. <clears throat> but these materials aren't just uh, beautiful they have the potential to be highly functional. So if you imagine, for instance, that a particular wavelength of light cannot pass through this material, uh, and you bore a hole through that crystal, then any light that enters one way has to exit the other. And so you've essentially created a waveguide for light. And if you think in a more science fiction scenario, uh, if you combine all different microstructures that have different optical effects, moving and processing light, uh, the same way that we process electrons as information, we may be able to create microstructured materials that compute with light. And so photonics is a, a very um, interesting and, and hopeful enterprise. <clears throat> and so how would we make such a material? And so immediately you might think, well, we can just directly write microstructure. I mean, you buy computer chips and their features are nanoscopic, not even microscopic. So the details that I'm talking about are more or less insignificant if you wanna just generate something. Um, but if we think about what if I wanna make a large volume of this material, is that feasible? And so for instance, this is an example of a, basically a, a functional photonic uh, crystal that uh, has you know, very well-behaved photonic properties and it takes about 25 minutes to write this little piece of material. Um, and so if we extrapolate that to just a cubic millimeter, which is really the lower limit of what you'd consider macroscopic, uh, it's gonna take over a year of just writing with a laser in, in photoresist. And so it's really not feasible. And so we imagine that an alternative strategy is to have individual building blocks, which are programmed to assemble simultaneously uh, into a desired structure instead of writing the structure sequentially. And so then the question becomes, how do we take a colloidal dispersion and have those particles find each other and reconfigure into a final architecture? <clears throat> and so there's a lot of ways that we can envision doing this, but I find that this is a very useful general guideline for how to program self-assembly. And the first uh, important step is to make sure that you're suspension of particles is stable. So what we saw in the last video was that we had particles diffusing randomly, kind of looked like a gas, and they do behave in a, like a gas in a lot of ways, and they have a kinetic energy of about kT, and they're going to move all around their environment. So you actually don't have to worry about them finding each other. They will collide. But we have to actually be concerned what happens upon collision, because if two particles, if two colloidal particles make contact, that contact is irreversible. They're never going to break apart. That's because van der Waals forces are so strong. And so if everything aggregates, 
and is stuck, then those particles can't reconfigure and explore their energy landscape and form an ordered material. And so what we have to make sure of is that there's some repulsive force that says, as two particles approach one another, some repulsion takes over that says, this is not favorable, and then the particles diffuse away. <clears throat> and so once we have a stable suspension, then all we have to do is add some attractive force. Um, what I have shown here is kind of one general scheme. It's, uh, again, there's a lot of ways to add an attractive force, but here you can imagine, for instance, some chemical handles that when two particles are close enough, they can uh, grab onto each other. And so that can form a colloidal bond. But again, we have to be careful because the potential well depth that you create through that attractive force has to be relatively shallow on the order of KT, the kinetic energy that the particles have, because you want them to find each other, but also break those bonds sometimes and move around each other. And like I said, explore the energy landscape. If that potential well is too deep, then again, you just have stuck particles. If it's too shallow, uh, then nothing binds, right? So it's a very delicate balance of attraction and repulsion, and which for, if, if you have spheres like this, you would end up probably with some FCC crystal structure. Um, and so the question is, uh, you know, how do you make colloids assemble? In short, give them an interaction potential like this. Right? <clears throat> and so most of the time we're dealing with spheres. Spheres are just simply the easiest shape to make. Isotropic spheres, they're sort of vanilla colloids. And so a really good strategy to expand the structures that you can assemble is to program an interaction that has sort of complementarity. Simply put, like particles repel each other, but dissimilar particles attract. And so then you gain this new tuning knob for the structure, which is the size ratio between those two particles. And so if one particle is much smaller than the other, or if they're equal in size, they find different packings and you can access different crystal structures. And so I'd say the premier way to uh, program complementarity is to coat colloidal particles in strands of DNA, which is a really interesting interaction because if I have particle, uh, the green particle that's coated in strand A, it's only going to form a bond with the red particle that has strand A prime. Another attractive feature here is that the hybridization that occurs between the DNA strands is temperature dependent. So as I heat it up, those will break and the bonds will break. And so we get this situation where at high temperature, we have purely repulsive force, but as we cool, that potential well dips down and at some point conditions are just right for crystallization. And so there have been a number of different formulations of DNA coated colloids, and there are a lot of different crystal structures that have been generated this way, but there are some drawbacks. Um, I, for me, the first thing is that uh, it's just chemically difficult. These things can be four or five synthetic steps. Um, and the, the, the difference between one batch and the other, it may not be so obvious what's gone wrong throughout because once you have your particle coded in DNA, maybe it's not so easy to say exactly how much is there, what's the coding, is it uniform? These are sort of amorphous features. Uh, and the other, Problem is just price. I mean, the DNA and the, the chemicals that make it attach, they're, they're very costly. And so you don't see these things occurring on the gram scale. <clears throat> and so our strategy is to use the natural surface charge of colloidal particles. And we can just naturally make particles that are negatively charged or positively charged. And I call this sort of free complementarity. They have this character that they'll repel a like particle and attract a dissimilar particle. Um, and I could show you some potential diagrams and more schematics, but I think it's much more useful to look at a sort of macroscopic model. And so here, I'm, as a stand-in for positive and negative colloids, I'm gonna be using two magnetic beads. You can just think of them as long range attractors. And so when I put them close to each other, of course, I'm just gonna to snap together. Now imagine that me shaking is, these beads together is thermal motion. You can see that it's rigid. It's not gonna break. The, this is what I would say is like an aggregated suspension. And so this is exactly what you'd expect. If I add positive and negative particles together, they're gonna to aggregate. It's, it's not gonna be a stable suspension. But what I can do is coat that attractor in something that prevents another attractor from getting too close and attenuate all of that really strong force and get just a weak attraction. And so I'm coating the magnetic sphere in some Play-Doh. And now you can see that the behavior is much different. They're still attracting magnetically, 
and they snap together. But now I can shake them around. You can see the reconfiguration and it even disconnects. So this is exactly the type of reconfiguration that you'd want to program into your colloidal particles. Attraction, but soft and reconfigurability. And the basic scheme is there. We have an attractor and it's coded in something that doesn't let another attractor get too close. So that attenuates the attraction. <clears throat> The specific particles, the specific tractors that we're gonna use are polystyrene particles, which are really good for our purpose because they're very easy to make. We just mix styrene monomer in water with an initiator and the initiator itself is what gives the particle its charge. So we can have either negatively charged or positively charged polystyrene particles on the gram scale, highly monodispersed model colloidal system. Now all we need to do is coat this in something that's gonna prevent an oppositely charged particle from getting too close. And for that purpose, we have this polymer attenuator. We form a polymer shell around the polystyrene particle. Uh, and it's not a fancy polymer either. This is a very common surfactant, pleuronic, uh, F108. Uh, it's even found in some of your mouthwashes. And so uh, this is something that's totally commercially available and it's very widely studied. So we have very common materials that we're using to tune all this interaction. What happens here, the pleuronic surfactant is comprised of three blocks, a core hydrophobic block and two arms that are hydrophilic. And the core hydrophobic block does the work to absorb onto the polystyrene surface. So it anchors the polymer very strongly. And then those arms stick out into the water phase and that's what provides that shell. <clears throat> and so specifically because the polystyrene is hydrophobic, this works very well. If you switch to a hydrophilic material, something like silica, it doesn't work so well because the polymer just kind of lies flat. And so um, while we can mix and match some materials, uh, the basic concept is that you need a charged particle and a robust polymer shell. And that's the basic elements that we need. And so we have our uh, attractor coated in an attenuator. And now there's one more key element, which is that we can control the interaction range of the electrostatics, okay? And so the charged particle is, is surrounded by a cloud of ions. And in low salt concentration, that uh, cloud of ions is very diffuse. And we can think of this as very long range electrostatic interactions. When we salt out, that or screen that charge with high salt concentration, that cloud of ions shrinks down towards the, the surface of the particle. And so basically, since we can tune the electrostatic interaction range, and we know that our particles are gonna be separated by this pretty well-defined brush of polymer, we can tune just the perfect electrostatic handshake so that we get uh, assembly and reconfiguration. <clears throat> So like I said, we should start with a stable suspension. So this is uh, just a nice visual to see what that might look like. And, and ultimately, if you can get your suspension stable, you can probably get it to crystallize. So first, I'm just gonna show what happens when we mix uh, positive and negative, bare particles, nothing to them, just, just raw out of, the, out of the pot. And so I just mix them together and we're gonna see immediately, terrible aggregates. Right, <clears throat> And now what I'm gonna do is add just a touch of F108 and a pinch of salt. And after I shake them up and add them together, uh, we're not gonna see any of that aggregation. And this is going to remain stable on the order of days or weeks. Okay, so we, we can actually, uh, with this polymer brush length, we can essentially tuck the electrostatic attraction under the brush and, and keep those particles uh, from interacting completely. So now it's actually a matter of just tuning the salt concentration just right so we get that electrostatic handshake. Uh, and so we should be looking for three behaviors. First is that I don't have enough salt. My interaction range is too long and all my particles aggregated. So at three millimolar, this is something you'll find. At the other end of the spectrum, we've got too much salt. The electrostatic attraction, uh, the electrostatic interaction has uh, essentially been tucked away under the polymer brush and the particles are not interacting. It's purely repulsive. Uh, and then it's, it remains stable. And finally, somewhere in between, we're gonna get an electrostatic bond that can also break. And so then we get reconfiguration crystallization. So you can see the window for this is relatively narrow, but still it's something that we can tune by just searching through conditions. Um, so 
for three, five, and seven millimolar, we can see microscopically what that behavior looks like, but you can even see macroscopically because the aggregates look like curdled milk. Um, the stable suspension looks like not curdled milk. And uh, the crystals will have a characteristic coloration due to Bragg scattering. So you actually don't even need to often look at the microscope. You can just mix particles at different salt concentrations and whichever one's calling out to you and saying, hey, I'm a giant crystal, you, you know. Um, <clears throat> okay, and so this is what it looks like live. This is a very dense suspension. This is like 5% weight particles. And so it looks a little chaotic. It looks like there's a bunch of aggregation to start with, uh, but then some islands start to pop up that look not like something totally disordered. And as those crystals start to grow and consume all the background particles, you can really see the uh, suspension start to clarify. And we can see that these are all domains. Uh, uh, these are each a different single crystal domain. When I have a more dilute sample, we can see much more clearly individual particles and crystalline planes, which is coming up now. And this is actually a sample that's been in a capillary reconfiguring for months. So this dance is just never ending, constantly finding the, low, the, the lowest energy um, and, and very stable. When we tune conditions just right, only a few nuclei are produced so that those nuclei eat up all the particles. And we can see that these uniform areas of color, these are each a single crystal with millimeter size uh, domains. <clears throat> Now I'll speak just briefly on the actual math behind it, the theory behind this interaction, uh, because it's such, I would say basic colloidal components and very well studied colloidal components that we can really go back to like first principles and describe it thoroughly and be confident that these are really what the energy landscapes look like. And so first I have my attraction, which is given by DLVO and uh, all of these variables, for the most part, can be um, taken from a conventional zeta sizer. You just uh, get your surface charge and your size of the particle, and then we know the salt concentration, and that's going to tell you the electrostatic potential. And the trend here is that at lower salt concentrations, my electrostatic attraction is deeper. At higher salt concentrations, where the uh, interaction is screened, it's more shallow. And then I have a repulsive potential from the polymer, and this is given by the Alexander de Gens model. Uh, this is all uh, very long, but basically what it says is that the length of the polymer as well as the surface coverage are both very important. And these are actually properties that are in literature because the Pleuronic series is so well studied, especially on polystyrene. So we know these values or at least feel confident with these values. And the result is that at different, as expected, at different salt concentrations, three, five, seven, we get different interaction potential wells, uh, which makes sense for how the assembly is occurring. We also see something that's important, which is that that equilibrium position, the, the, the bottom of that potential well, it's not too far off from the value of the, the length of the two brushes fully extended. So it really is sort of like a, a a hard wall barrier. And that's very important for just estimating like, uh, where are my particles and how far does my electrostatic attraction need to reach? Um, and so this turned out to be you know, a good confirmation to what we thought, which is that the polymer is very robust. And we can take all this information and plug it directly into simulation. And uh, the behavior is you know, very well matching what we find experimentally, where we expect it to aggregate, it aggregates, where we expect it to crystallize, it does so. <clears throat> okay, so there's one more, um, capability of our interaction that I need to talk about, which is the ability to take these soft structures, because remember, these are just a few KT bonds. And if I took that vial and I shook it up, everything would just redisperse. Okay? But we're actually able to do something to fix that structure in a very robust way, which is not a trivial problem. And again, I could show some potentials and, and schematics, but I think a macroscopic model, again, is going to do a lot of good because all we need to happen is for the attraction to beat out the repulsion. And so I achieve that by using some Play-Doh with a thinner shell. And so this is actually a perfect representation of the phenomena that occurs, which is displacement flocculation. Those attractors want to get to each other. The polymer, the Play-Doh could not hold them back and it pushed it out of the way and 
they aggregated. Now it's a solid bond. And so this is exactly what we're going to be doing in our colloidal system. However, instead of using a shorter brush or something like that, we're just going to dilute out all those screening ions and take that short range interaction and make it very long range. And you can see that that interaction potential drops precipitously. So we're going from a few kT to hundreds. That forms a solid sediment from something that was once very soft and crystalline and I could shake it up and it would disperse. Now it's a pellet, a pellet that can survive drying. I can even crack it open and all the particles stay within their crystal structure. And this is actually so fun to do because you can mix 100 experiments in a day and whichever ones are just bright and shiny, uh, you fix them and you get to an SEM and there's just a giant landscape of, of craters and, and different crystals at different orientations, sometimes different crystal structures, depending on what you're dealing with. <clears throat> the other thing we can do with that dried product is embed it in a new medium. And this is really exciting because um, based on the refractive index, mismatch between the particles and the medium, you're going to get a different level of penetration of the light. And so in this uh, epoxy resin, which is now a, a very robust material, I can hold it, I can bend it and do all sorts of things with it. Uh, the light is penetrating very deep in the crystal. And so a lot of those planes, a lot of those crystalline planes are getting to contribute to the scattering. And so the optical effects just really pop so much so that it oversaturates my uh, camera on my phone especially the blues, the, you can, you know, they just, they're so bright. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now that we see basically what, what we can do with this, we're gonna just explore some structures. Um, DNA particles can make different crystal structures by changing the size ratio. Uh, you know, no news here, we, we made the same structures. We're thinking that we have probably several more that we haven't fully characterized as of yet. But um, you know, basically we can make the binary crystals that have been made and we expect to be able to make more. The only difference here is that because our interaction is so simple, um, we can make more complex particles, like for instance, make a cluster of those spheres and then potentially use those as building blocks. Um, now that can be done too with DNA. And of course it has been, except again, it's, there's a synthetic barrier to making a complex particle and then doing a complex functionalization. By cutting out that, that functionalization step and just using the natural surface charge, we're just more accessible to different crystal structures. <clears throat> the important thing about these different crystal structures in our case is that uh, for whatever reason, and I think it's because we can very precisely tune the interaction strength. We have seen in many cases, the growth of uh, regular crystal habits, which is actually a very unique capability for colloidal self-assembly. So for instance, the cesium chloride structure, it always grows with this uh, rhombic dodecahedral habit, which is what we'd expect. We've seen actually rhombic dodecahedra form from cesium chloride type uh, nanoparticle lattices. And so it's not a surprise to see it, but it's very promising that we do see it because that means we have a well-defined surface energy. Um, the surface planes here are the 110 plane, which is characterized by stripes of positive and negative. And it's actually should be the same habit that cesium molecular cesium chloride should take. However, I don't, I've never actually seen a, a rhombic dodecahedra cesium chloride crystal, and I'm not sure why. Um, so this habit, these are relatively small crystallites of five or 10 nanometers, uh, excuse me, microns. But that habit persists through 100 micron crystals, even up to a millimeter. And so this crystal in particular demonstrates um, what can be done with relative ease, which is that we just shake up um, obsolete charged particles with some soap and salt and some of the crystals grow to enormous size. I think here the trick was that a nucleation event stuck to the side of the vial while the rest sedimented. And then it didn't crowd up with all the other crystals and, and was able to just consume particles and grow uh, for a few days. And so then we're left with this you know, macroscopic object. We can see this is on the back of a penny. And um, just once again, these rhombic dodecahedral shapes are present. And if we look closely at each of these planes, we're not gonna see them because we're so zoomed out. But if we look closely at each of these planes, it's again, it's the one, one, zero. So we get well-defined habit across length scales. <clears throat> 
Um, <clears throat> now, if we change the crystal structure, uh, we'll of course change the habit. And so this is a very interesting one because the ALB2 crystal uh, grows highly anisotropic. So for whatever reason, one growth direction is uh, highly preferred and they grow as very long, sharp needles. Um, <clears throat> which is of course interesting because we started with isotropic particles. They're the same on all sides, but now it's growing material that's growing anisotropically. So here's a, an optical image of, of one of the planes against the glass. And because we can fix it, so it's, it's not clear to see when it's against the glass exactly why it's happening, or I, I guess you could say, what, um, what direction is it growing in? Like it gives, gives some hint as to what's happening, but since we can fix it and look very close at a single particle level on an SEM, we can see that the growth direction uh, gives you this railroad pattern. And so we can tell uh, at least which planes are preferred and which planes are not preferred to grow. And so if you look at the ALB2 structure here, if you remove the, the top two particles, you can see those, those two. Um, those two and the repeat unit would just go like that. So, so you know the growth direction at least, and that can give you at least some idea of the energetics involved. <clears throat> um, moreover, that crystal has some really cool optical properties. And this is a little hard for me to explain why it's what's happening is happening. But what you see in this video is I'm just taking a light and shining it back and forth. And so, some of the crystals that are tilted this way shine. And then as I rotate, the crystals that are tilted that way shine. And you can sort of see the curvature um, of which crystals are catching the light. And so it makes sense, like I'm shining light anisotropically, and then there is an anisotropic response, right? That kind of makes sense. But even under isotropic illumination, so we're just, it's just bright field with some polarizers, um, we get different coloration due to the orientation of the needle. And so uh, crystals that are going up and down and left and right are green and crystals that are in a diagonal are red. And if we rotate that, um, the red ones will turn green, the green, was, green ones will turn red. So again, this is a very interesting thing because we started with isotropic building blocks and now we have uh, an isotropic optical response. So um, yeah. <clears throat> All right, so the last, topic of crystals that I'm going to talk about is something that we saw in um, simulation, which is that a surface can uh, affect very significantly how the crystals are growing. Okay, so in the bulk, of course, the cesium chloride, as I described, is going to grow a rhombic dodecahedral habit. But when there's a surface present, we instead see the growth of these pyramids. Um, there's also a rare case where instead of a pyramid growing, we get something like a truncated rhombic dodecahedra. We get these sort of um, higher order planes that give um, sort of odd shapes. Uh, but overall, the idea here is that a different plane than the 110 is being preferred, which then templates the growth of the crystal up. So it's still a cesium chloride crystal, uh, but one plane is affecting the, the overall three-dimensional structure. <clears throat> and we get a hint of how to make that happen in experiment if we watch the simulation live. And so the hint is that those pyramids are moving around. Okay, That's, seems kind of obvious because it doesn't energetically change as I just shift it. <clears throat> but that's really important because in the experiment, the charged surface that we're talking about is a silica capillary and the particles don't reconfigure against that surface. Okay, So, so actually without um, getting that reconfiguration, we don't expect to see uh, these, these bases templating the growth. And so we found a, a nice trick, which is that the capillary itself can be hydrophobized with a silane <clears throat> and that allows that polymer brush that we use to stabilize the polystyrene to also stabilize the glass. And so now when we have a hydrophobized capillary that's stabilized, now our particles are growing specific planes against the glass. Okay? And so already we see a cool effect, which is that the negative glass templates positive particles, the positive particles shown in green. <clears throat> 
So the first layer is, is all green particles. Now, when we flip the sign of the glass by treating it with a different silane, so we have positive glass, now our first layer is red negative particles. Okay, well, this kind of makes sense. Um, on that negative glass, we see something that I thought was astounding, which is that there are specific species of crystals that grow, and they have such a characteristic look about them. And so what we find are, on the bottom here, these three, there are yellow squares, uh, green hexagons and pink hexagons. And they're so characteristic that you can just count them up. And so this is after tallying 200 different crystallites and we have a large majority of the yellow pyramids um, followed by the green hexagons and last the pink hexagons. And after a little bit of speculation and experimentation, we kind of figured out exactly what was going on, which is that the 100 plane uh, was templating that square shape and growing uh, the square pyramids that you saw in the uh, simulation. And so it makes sense that this is the highest um, yield of crystal, because if you were to cut through cesium chloride in any direction you want, the highest planar density of positive particles is through the 100. So we get the square packing that's, we can't get any more positive than that. And so it's just simply presenting the most positivity to the glass as it can. <clears throat> and so then we ask, well, why are they all yellow? Well, it's, it's actually kind of obvious if you think about it, the crystal is gonna scatter light in an orientationally dependent manner and they all have the same orientation. And so now if I template a different face, I'm growing the same crystal, but at a different orientation. And so I go from a 100 to a 111. And so the 111 plane looks like this. Again, this is the second most uh, second highest planar density of positive particles uh, that templates this hexagonal plane. And then it grows up as sort of a three-sided pyramid. And so those have a different orientation than the, the square pyramids. And so instead of being yellow, they're green. And finally, the, the least, um, the lowest yield of crystal we see is templated by the 110, which is the bulk face. Uh, and they sort of look like uh, truncated rhombic dodecahedra, and they come out pink. <clears throat> Okay, so um, <clears throat> we, we have an interaction with the glass and we also have the interaction with the particles. And uh, when we change the condition, the, the relative interaction strengths change. And so basically just tuning through different conditions, we can find some different behaviors. So for example, you can make it such that the glass doesn't have much of an effect if the particles are strongly attracted to each other. Um, and, and not very strongly attracted to the glass. And so you can get almost all rhombic dodecahedra, but you can make the interaction with the glass more significant and then template a single crystal shape. And that's what we did here. And so here, uh, the only three-dimensional crystal shape that's growing is from the 100 plane. So we've grown uh, a, essentially a pure phase of these pyramidal shapes. And this is an image that's so exciting to me because it harkens back to that image of a science fiction photonic chip where there's a, you know, a micropolis city of, of little structures that shuttle light from one area to another performing computations. Um, and, and to me, that, that says a lot about the potential of, of what we can do with this because we're, we're still just working with very, very simple objects. And now the question is, what's gonna happen when we make the building blocks a little more complicated? change their shape, give them some surface pattern. What's gonna happen if we get a polymer shell that's responsive, that can change uh, length on command? What's gonna happen when we have uh, a surface that itself is templated with a pattern? Can we grow a circuit literally from the bottom up? Okay, and so just to recap, <clears throat> um, so I hope I've shown you that self-assembly is really a critical tool that we, we need to master if we're going to assemble um, high quality and large scale microstructured materials. Um, also that the basic concept that, that I'm demonstrating here with uh, an attractor surrounded by an attenuator is a simple concept that can be applied in many different ways to yield in a logical way, um, crystalline structures. And that the crystals that we grow from those structures have a high degree of control in the structure itself, the shape of the habit, as well as some of the optical properties. 
And with that, I'll just acknowledge everyone in the Sakana lab, uh, as well as our extended PAX team and some of our funding sources. And uh, thank all of you for your attention and for the invitation to speak today. I really appreciate it.